Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Uh, today we're going to get into part two of Extra History's Bismarck series. I'm hoping to record uh, the next Sabaton video and Sabaton history video later on this afternoon. That'll be totally dependent on whether I stay feeling okay or if I go downhill. So no promises on getting the next Sabaton video out today, but the latest it should be out is about this time tomorrow. So uh, that'll be coming up next. I have uh, the next Chunk video of the Hannibal series that's going to be out in the next couple of days. So a whole couple of things that I'm trying to get to, um, hoping that I pull out of this, this slump and start feeling better. But like I said, today we're going to start with part two of Hunting the Bismarck, the mighty HMS Hood. Let's get into it. The HMS Hood and Prince of Wales plow toward the Bismarck and destiny. This episode is sponsored by Wargaming. Download World of Warships and use the code EXTRA1 for free goodies. Link in the description. When we left off, the British had finally located the battleship Bismarck and the heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen as they steamed south through the Denmark Strait. And with Admiral Tovey and the rest of the home fleet still hundreds of miles away, it was clear that the Hood, pride of the Royal Navy, and Prince of Wales were the only ones that could possibly stop the behemoth. But to understand what's about to happen, we need to understand the state of the Royal Navy in 1941, and how interwar limitations held back their naval development. For that, allow me to turn things over to Wargaming's military expert, Richard Cutland. Following World War I, a series of maritime treaties constrained naval development in the hopes of defusing an international arms race. At first, these treaties limited the number of new ships and set limits on the size and armament of new vessels. But later agreements eliminated the possibility of building new battleships completely. As a result, in the interwar period, Britain was forced to modernise old ships instead of building new ones. For example, the HMS Hood looked strong enough to any outside observer, but the British Admiralty was well aware of its main drawback, a weak horizontal defence, especially at Deck 25, which was only 76mm thick. Plans to strengthen the horizontal armour had been developed back in 1927, but these works were postponed due to financial problems. In the end, they never happened at all and this made the ship vulnerable to long-range plunging fire that fell directly down on its deck. These treaties also constrained new battleships, like Prince of Wales, to quite conservative designs. Their armament consisted of two four-gun turrets and one two-gun turret, all in a 14-inch calibre that complied with treaty limitations. Meanwhile, Germany was quietly violating these treaties with ships like Bismarck that had 15-inch guns. So even though Prince of Wales was brand new, it was underpowered at launch. In addition, the brand new Prince of Wales had teething problems. Sea trials revealed that her revolutionary quadruple gun turrets were prone to break down under strain, and this problem hadn't yet been fixed when she deployed with Hood. However, Prince of Wales was more technologically advanced than the Hood, particularly since she had modern rangefinders. And crucially, both Hood and Prince of Wales were fast, and speed was what the Royal Navy needed in an interception force. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Cutland. So that's the... Yeah, that was all good information. The big part of this, right, is that the treaties and agreements between World War One and World War Two were... You know, these have, have been around for a long time, and it's... They're kind of interesting developments historically because it, it kind of depends on who suggests it that determines from an outside viewer's perspective why they're trying to do it. Um, for instance, like when uh, Russia wanted to, to have an, an arms treaty leading into World War I, it looked very, very much like well, it looked like Russia was getting left behind in the arms race. And so it would be very beneficial for them if the arms race really, really slowed down, right? Um, but that's what happens here. They have the treaties. They have the agreements. Germany um, doesn't adhere to them with the Bismarck. And so, yeah, when 
when the war starts, you have even new ships from the British Navy are already outgunned um, just because they adhered to the treaty and and the Bismarck did not. And so that's a, a huge thing here. And the Hood's weak deck is going to be a big deal. That That you would think that maybe that's not a likely shot to have one come straight up and straight down, but it doesn't really have to come straight up and straight down. By this point, the the ships are shooting projectiles so far that the trajectory doesn't have to be, you know, straight up and straight down. It's launching it so far horizontally that it could come down on on top of the ship um, just, you know, just if they have it lined up correctly, it's, you know, as likely to hit there as it is to slam into the side of the ship. So um, it's, it's something that's going to be important in a whole little bit. Situation. The capable but vulnerable Hood and untested Prince of Wales are about to take on the largest and most modern warships on Earth. 24th of May, 0537 hours, the Denmark Strait. Our British sailors have gotten little sleep, knowing that they would intercept the Bismarck at dawn. On the Prince of Wales, civilian contractors have worked through the night repairing its turret guns, whose hydraulic systems are acting up. Most of the Prince of Wales crew are fresh recruits, and they're nervous. But the presence of the Hood stills their jitters. Just then, a lookout on Hood sees smoke on the horizon. The Bismarck and the Prince Eugen. Admiral Holland sends a ciphered message to the rest of the fleet. From Hood, enemy in sight, am engaging. But Holland's running almost parallel to the enemy, the four ships converging slowly as they head southwest. That's no good. Not only does he need to get between Bismarck and the Atlantic, but the Hood's thin deck armor will be vulnerable to plunging fire unless he gets within nine miles. By cutting a path directly toward the Germans, he'll close the distance as fast as possible and be harder to hit, but it'll also have his firepower since his rear turrets can't join the fight. But there's nothing for it. The Bismarck could still evade. Holland turns to an interception course and orders full speed ahead. At 0552 hours... See, so that's actually, that's actually pretty brilliant, right? Because like I was just talking about, the guns can, the turret guns can shoot so far by this point that you, you have a pretty high likelihood of getting hit, you know, uh, the, the closer you get, the harder it's going to be for them to, to have one come, a shell come straight up and straight down, right? Because the closer you get, the more that's actually going to have to happen that it goes straight up and straight down. So the idea is not only are we going to intercept it, not only are we going to, you know, cut it off from the Atlantic, but we are going to make it less likely the closer we get that we will take fire in the place that we are most vulnerable, right? The issue with that, like he said, is that when you do that, you don't have your your side guns on to the ship, so you you cut your firepower. But I feel like that's the the... If you're having to intercept them here, and you are the hood, um, first of all, they're all they're obviously outmatched, right? But if you have to intercept them, I feel like this is the best move. This naval battle has been picked apart. There are entire books that are written about this particular naval battle. Um, but I feel like this is probably the best move: is to cut straight towards it. Holland orders Prince of Wales to target the lead ship. But the gunnery officer on the Prince of Wales, working with more modern optics, makes a startling realization. The Hood has targeted the wrong ship. Bismarck and Prince Eugen have similar silhouettes, and the Germans have defied convention by sending the lighter armored heavy cruiser first. He tries to communicate this to the Hood, but it's too late. The Hood opens fire, wreathing the vessel in dirty brown smoke. Seeing this, the desperate gunnery officer defies the Hood's order, targets the Bismarck, and fires. On both ships, the gunnery officers look at their watches, waiting. Fifty seconds later, pillars of water leap up in front of the German ships. The salvos fall short. Worse still, one of the guns in Prince of Wales' B turret malfunctions, taking it out of the action. Both ships are readjusting their aim when flashes of light run up and down the German ships. A long-range artillery duel has begun. 
Two minutes later, a shell from Prince Eugen crashes into the hood's upper deck, detonating an ammunition locker. It burns with pink flames, anti-aircraft shells cooking off in bunches like firecrackers. On the hood's bridge, the crew can hear the screams of their burning shipmates coming through the voice pipes. Admiral Holland keeps calm, but then huge columns of water leap into the air ahead of the bow, and he finally realizes that he's been shooting at the wrong ship. He hastily sends the order to retarget the Bismarck and orders a turn to port in order to bring his aft turrets to bear. It will expose him side on with the enemy, but with luck, the Hood's turn will pass just inside the nine mile mark and shield him from plunging fire. The turn comes just in time. Bismarck's next salvo thunders down right where the Hood had been headed. With all fire concentrated on Hood, Prince of Wales has been free to get range on the Bismarck and scores at least one hit. But her intricate four-gun turrets aren't holding up to the strain, and every few salvos, another gun goes out of action. It follows Hood into the turn, facing the German ships side on. A salvo from Bismarck brackets the Hood, shells landing on either side of the vessel. The Prince of Wales' commander, Captain Leach, knows that once a ship is bracketed, the enemy has you. He sees the Bismarck's guns flash in double time, and trains his binoculars on the Hood to see the result. A shell plunges down on Hood's deck, just aft of the mainmast, and disappears. Two seconds later, the middle of the Hood erupts like a Roman candle, spraying flames hundreds of feet in the air. As Leech looks on, horrified, a colossal explosion tears the ship in two, the stern rising up out of the water as the bow sails forward under its own momentum. Yellow smoke blankets the carnage. In all the smoke, the Hood's bridge crew don't know where they've been hit, or how badly. Bodies begin raining down on the bridge, thumping off the roof and landing on the wings. And just like the Bismarck is the, you know, it's the it's this massive ship. It's a huge um, feather in the cap of the, the German Navy, of the Kriegsmarine. But it's also this pseudo-political and, like, uh, social standing, right? Like, it's... It's uh, kind of the visible uh, part of the Navy that the Germans put out to like show the, the strength of the Navy, right? Um, the hood is that for the British. And so this is a devastating loss for the British Navy to lose the hood. Now, again, we can get into um, whether or not that really should have been the case or... You know, because it's already outgunned, um, this is a bad position for it to be in. But all the same, the Hood was that ship for the British, for the British people, for the British Navy, and it's been destroyed. So this is very quickly going to become like a, not only do we want to stop the Bismarck from wreaking havoc in the Atlantic, but it becomes kind of a, a revenge mission. From below, the helmsman reports through a voice pipe that the steering isn't answering. The ship begins to list, first to port, and then capsizing 45 degrees to starboard. There's no need for an evacuation order. The crew lines up single file at the port side hatch, waiting their turn to scramble out. The squadron's navigating officer stands aside, letting junior seamen go first. One crewman glances back. He sees Admiral Holland still sitting in his command chair, going down with his ship. Seconds later, the sailor steps off the hood and into the freezing water of the Denmark Strait. Above him, he sees the majestic lines of the hood, sinking in a V formation. A turret fires a last defiant salvo before it slips into the water. And then the suction pulls him under. On the Prince of Wales, Captain Leach orders an evasive maneuver to avoid colliding with hood's rapidly sinking stern. It disappears underwater as they pass. Nothing remains of the Royal Navy's largest and most famous ship except a burning debris field. It is now one malfunctioning ship against two, and Leech has sailed right into the Hood's former position. The Germans barely have to adjust their rangefinders. But just then, a salvo from Prince of Wales straddles Bismarck. Leech nods approval. Now that Prince of Wales has the correct range, she can... Bang! One compartment below the bridge, the navigation officer hears a crash above him. He shouts into the voice pipe, asking if everything's all right. At first, there's no answer. And then a stream of blood dribbles out, staining his charts. Leech gets unsteadily to his feet. One of the Bismarck's shells has hit the bridge and passed through without exploding. 
His entire bridge crew lies dead, except for two wounded officers. For three hellish minutes, shells pound the Prince of Wales. The armor belt takes multiple hits. The boat deck catches fire. In one of the turret magazines, a shell punches through the deck and lands, still live, next to a sailor's foot. The magazine crew is told to hang on to it until ordnance disposal arrives, but they're not waiting. They lift the shell up out of the turret and gingerly carry it across the deck amid a full-scale battle. Yeah, so, uh, first off, imagine that. Imagine you're a sailor on, on this boat, and you have a shell come through, crash into the ship, doesn't doesn't explode but it's a live shell and then you're told your your you know co there tells you wait uh ordinance disposal will come and get it and and you're like wait it's a live shell like we're lucky we're not all dead like there's no way i'm waiting to to get rid of this thing um that that's just that's kind of bizarre that that they would be asked to do that um but also, the Prince of Wales is in a dangerous situation here, right? It was already outgunned with the hood there. Now the hood is gone. Um, it really needs to get out of this situation or, or it's going to be with the hood. And also, one of the things that it can't do because of this situation is it can't, it can't uh, scrape for survivors from the hood. Because it's in the situation that it's in, it's going to have to get out of Dodge as quickly as possible. And so it's going to take a while for anybody to come around and look for survivors. And they're not going to be, they're not going to be very many. With a sigh of relief, they pitch it over the side. Captain Leach knows he's been outfought. He turns to withdraw, making smoke to cover his retreat. The Bismarck, curiously, does not follow. Keeping well out of range, Leech brings the mauled Prince of Wales around to join the cruisers shadowing Bismarck. He signals the Admiralty. Hood has blown up. One hour after the Hood's sinking, a destroyer arrives to look for survivors. On deck, they have rafts, life belts, and blankets lined up and ready. The medical crew is prepared to treat hundreds. Instead, they pull three oil-slicked survivors out of the water. Three out of a crew of 1,418. 1022 Ooh. hours, the Admiralty. Faces are grim in the Admiralty's war room, 200 feet below the streets of London. The shock of losing the hood is compounded by the knowledge that German battleships were now in position to prey on vital convoys. But as the news settles in, bleak horror gives way to determined rage. The phone rings. It's Prime Minister Churchill with a personal order for every able ship in the Atlantic. It is direct and to the point. Admiralty Cipher officers broadcast the order wide. The aircraft carrier Ark Royal receives the signal at Gibraltar and begins to unpack its torpedo bombers. Tovey's home fleet receives the message as they race to join the stricken Prince of Wales. The battleship Rodney, headed for a refit in Boston, gets the signal and slowly turns its 16-inch guns back toward Europe. The airwaves are thick with this one message. Sink the Bismarck. Sink the Bismarck. Sink the Bismarck. Yeah, so like I said, it goes from a don't want the Bismarck in the Atlantic, uh, don't want it to wreck shipping convoys, which is a huge danger here. Um, it's the only thing keeping Britain afloat in this war are the shipping convoys. Obviously, they're an island nation, and so they have to export their goods, especially during wartime. Um, that could cause huge problems, but now that it has sunk the hood, the hood that was the standard, it was the, the, you know, bearer for the British Navy, um, there's, they want revenge, right? And so there's this, this determination that comes across the British, specifically the British Navy and Admiralty, where... Okay, well, whatever it takes, that's kind of what the direction it goes is no more like trying to trying to keep it out of here or catch it in there. Whatever it takes, go sink the damn thing. So, um, all right, that was Extra History's Hunting the Bismarck Part 2 uh, over the sinking of the, the HMS Hood. Uh, I'll, like I said, I'll try to get the Sabaton, next Sabaton video out this afternoon. 
latest will be tomorrow if I start feeling terrible again this afternoon. But as always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here, and I will see you all next time.